Amen. Grateful uh, to God. Uh, let's fan that flame on my daughter that says she want to be a missionary. <laughs> fan that flame. Help me. Help me. Help me. <laughs> help that. We, we're grateful for that. Grateful for to be here, to be back home. Uh, grateful to, to be in God's house uh, in this seminary, the seminary of the apostles, <laughs> right? John Nixon is how I heard about the University of Mobile. He was a graduate, got his PhD from from uh, Southeastern. He was one of my professors at the at University of Mobile. He saw something in me that I didn't see in myself uh, that I needed more education. I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing, right? <laughs> uh, but anyway, I found out about him, heard about Dr. Aiken. Uh, I listened to Dr. Aiken preach in class, my preaching class in college. And uh, man, when I came on campus, uh, when I became a student, I was, man, I was scared. <laughs> I was scared. I still am. Uh, but. <laughs> I, I was scared a number of reasons. I had just recently got married. I didn't know if she was going to stay with me. Uh, I was scared because I grew up with a learning disability. I struggled to read, struggled to write. I, I was just, it was just a miracle. I graduated college, you know, and just, I was scared on a number of levels. But I was most definitely scared when I took Dr. Aiken's biblical hermeneutics class. I sat on the front row, I'll never forget it. Man, it gave us notes, this big notebook. Some of y'all, I don't know if some of y'all, you still pass those notebooks out, but man, I mean, I mean could I get an amen? I, I saw those notebooks, I'm like, oh God, help me, Jesus. I don't know how I'm gonna get out of this, but, <laughs> but I'll tell you uh, what Dr. Aiken has invested in me. He was teaching me how big this God is, how good this God is, or how much this God needs to go to the neighborhood and to the nations. And I'm super grateful for that. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, they talk about me being the first African-American president of the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina. I don't even think about that. I just love my brothers, man. Love North Carolina. Uh, love to, to travel around and encourage people in the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's all about him. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we're grateful for what God is doing, the good work that he has, has started our lives. We sang about such a great salvation that we have. And, and I don't know about you, but man, I, uh, black people need them. White people need them. Yellow people need them. All people need him and that's what you are training to go and to make him glad man in the neighborhood and to the nations and so I'm super grateful to be here I want to preach this morning out of Psalm 24 and I want to preach to a 23 year old me when I sat in your seats I want to preach to a 23 year old me and I want to preach to a 39 year old me because nothing changes our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the same words that I want to tell myself 20, when I was 23, 16 years ago. Psalm 24 is where we'll be. And if you could do me a favor, just stand one more time out of reverence to the reading of the word of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but we know the word of God that abides forever. The psalmist writes, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the sea and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the, the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy hill, holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? It's the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's pray. Father, we need you. God, we need you to be glorified today. We need you in this message. I pray I can preach as a dying man to dying men and women that one day we'll give glory to you. So, Father, I pray you take my words, use them to transform us into the image of your son, Jesus. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing and reading the reverence of the word of God. You know, I, I got this sentence, this pregnant sentence I want to try to grab before we, you know, jump into this text. The people of God, right? God's people, we must worship Him. We must praise God at all times. 
We must praise him at all times. There's reasons why we should praise God at all times. And, and Alan Ross, he, he, was a com he wrote um, a commentary on the book of Psalms. He, he, he gave me a lot of help as I was studying this passage. And he gives some background work here to kind of help us get some context to the psalm. Alan Ross, he says, the, the eternal evidence suggests that the Israelites had just returned from, from the victorious battle with the Canaanites. They were proceeding to, 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 to enter into the sanctuary to praise the Lord for the great mighty victory in battle, carrying with them the glorious Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of the Lord's presence with them. As they approached the gates, they were met with, by Levitical gatekeepers. It was the, the, worship, it was the worshiper's part to, to ask who will enter the sanctuary, who could enter the sanctuary of the Lord. It was the gatekeeper's part to answer with them the standard set down in the law, the perfect uh, law of righteousness. The worshipers in this case did not claim to qualify, they did not claim to, to have to be qualified to enter into this, this, this sanctuary. Rather, they responded that they were simply seeking the Lord's favor, a response that indicates that they wanted to meet the Lord's requirements. But had not bring had to bring they had to bring sacrifices in order to do that. I'll tell you, Alan Ross gives us some some, some background into the text. But I want you to walk with me this morning as as we walk through this. The psalmist, I, I want us to see the first reason why we should praise God is 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 that God is He must be praised because of His handiwork. His, his handiwork, look at verse one. You'll see it. It says, "The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof." The world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. You see, the, 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 the point here is this, is that our God is a creator God. This goes back to uh, Genesis and, and 1, and as God created this earth. You know, this, 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 creating, this creation, God created it and God sustains it. We praise God because he is the creator God. And it's made me think this morning, hey, y'all going to have to stop being stiff up in here, man. Y'all going to have to walk with me today. This made me think this week I was reading, I don't know if you caught this, but uh, man, it's a sad story about um, Heath Lambert. He's a pastor of First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida. And he said this, he says, in the last week, I learned that I required another surgery. He, he, he's had five of these surgeries. So it, it was pain, he said it was painfully ironic that I, I was learning that I need my fifth brain surgery during, during the release of my new book. Five brain surgeries, and he went in detail on what all is entailed with this surgery. I want to ask a question. I want to ask the student here this morning. How do you praise God when there's pain? How do you praise God when, it, when you're at war? right? I mean, they, they, they were coming to, from, from victory, right? They, they were praising God from victory, but I want to ask the question, how do you praise him in pain? Brother Heath here understands that we must praise God in any and every situation. We must praise him in any and every situation. As Israel is at war, they must remember that they should praise God because it's the God that will win the victory for them. You know, our God is a sovereign God. We hold to a God that is totally in control. And when we read these first two verses, the sovereignty of God is leaking all over these verses. And the reality is, is this, is that we got a God that is, he never slumbers nor sleeps. He's always awake. He's always on our side, no matter what it is that we go through in this life. No matter what battles we must face in this life, we have a God that is the creator and everything in it, he sustains. I say this because you are a student and you think, man, once you graduate, everything will be all peaches and cream. It don't necessarily work that way. I mean, this is a brother that is at First Baptist Jacksonville, big church, blowing and going, great place, a lot of history, but he has problems. And he has to stand and proclaim about this sovereign God while he is in pain. 
You know, Jim Hamilton, he said this. He says, all the territory in existence, all life forms that inhabit, it's belong, it belongs to Yahweh. This means that there is no realm he does not claim as his own. No plot where his sovereignty does not hold sway. No corridor or crevice where he fails to enforce his will. Moreover, all living beings belong to God, the God of the Bible. No creature is autonomous. My culture can, can, can hold that today, but neither fleas nor flying things are, are free from his authority. All humans in all places belong to him, along with the, all the rock badgers, the rats, the bats, the cats, and whatever it may be. Abraham Kuyper famously said, there is no square inch in the whole creation over which Christ, our sovereign creator, does not say, mine. I am Lord over it. Folks, we must hold to this sovereign God. No, we ain't robots. We just operate and we listen to the voice of God. Israel must remember who has fought their battle for them. We must remember who fights our battles for us. We too have to remember this over and over again, that Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, right, is with them. We must remember that our God is with us. This should cause us to praise him. Amen. We should be a people who are praising him at all times. Not only do we, we see this, this, uh, this, this praise because of the handiwork of God, but we see this praise because of the holiness of God. The holiness of God. Look at verse 3. Uh, it says, who shall ascend the, the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in this holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false. Alan Ross gives us some more insight here. He says that, that he talks about this abrupt change that, that, that has taken place it, right here in, in verse 3. He says that it's called the, 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 the liturgy at the gate, right? It's a ritual designed to prepare people to enter the sanctuary and enjoy communion with the Lord talked about many of the Levites were assigned to be these gatekeepers, right? Their task was to make sure that the people who came into the sanctuary, they met the requirements of holiness and had the, the proper sacrifices. As the worshipers had, had heard each time the standard for entrance into the presence of God, they would have, they have, would have knowledge that their need of God's provision in order to worship him. Man, what if we did that today, that we, before we entered into God's presence, that we, man, we, we, we must understand that God is still concerned about holy living. And he, we must understand that God is a God that is a holy God. That, that, that he is a God that Isaiah fell down, man. He is a God that we must remember that we can't leave, live any kind of way we want to live. We can't live any kind of way we want to live if we're going to walk into the presence, in the presence of the Lord. He describes this individual, right, in four ways, this person who can enter, right? He, he says he, he must have clean hands, right? He must have a pure heart. He must not lift up his soul to what is false, and he must not swear deceitfully. Now, who do you know that got a pure heart? <laughs> Who do you know have clean hands, right? I mean, uh, there's only one, and we're going to get to him, but, but I want to tell you, Moses, it wasn't Moses. Moses murdered somebody, right? Moses just saw the promised land. He didn't get to go, right? Because he disobeyed God. It wasn't Moses. It, it wasn't David, because David, had, he was an adulterer. He was a murderer. I mean, it was the son of God, right? The greater Moses, the, the greater David, right? What about our heroes? Maybe, maybe we worship in Paul and Apollos, and, right? No, we worship Jesus, the, the name that is above every name. And that, that at the name of Jesus, it's the only way we have access. The Bible says this, that, that in Psalm 20, verse 7, it says, Some men trust in chariots and some men trust in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We hold to the, the, to the rope that never breaks. But we hold to the God that never slumbers nor sleeps. And I want to tell you this morning, students, grab hold of him. We must take our eyes off man and put it on the God man. As you study, you, you study about this God. We study about great men. Yes, we do. But you keep your eyes on this God because man will fail you. I'll never forget just a year or two ago, I was on vacation. I was working on my tan, you know, at the beach. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, working on my tan. 
And so we were at the beach, and, 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 and uh, my, my wife was reading um, something to me. Uh, one of my heroes in the faith, man, he uh, basically I found out that he, man, he, was, he was living in sin. He, he was committing adultery and, and, and lying and doing all kinds of crap. And I just sat there, and I just wept. I mean, listen, my joy in, in life, my, my one thing that I wanted to do when I was a teenager was just go to his church. He was my hero, man. I think he couldn't do nothing wrong. And I found out right there when my wife read that article to me, I just started weeping. I just started weeping and I said, oh God, oh God, God, I must look to you. Too many preachers, too many people have taken their eyes off Jesus. Too many people have taken their eyes off this holy God. And we must put our gaze on him, and we must not look to our left and to our right, but we must have our gaze fixed on this holy God. Because there's only one way we can enter into his presence. There's only one individual, and we see it in number three, this third point. We must praise because of the hand of God. Look at verse five. You'll see it. It says, he will receive the blessings of the Lord. That, that, that he, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to another. He, he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. See, we got blessings here. We, we got blessings if we come to God rightly. We, we're, we're blessed if we come to him rightly. We see blessings, we see righteousness, and we see salvation. It is important to note that, man, I ain't talking about a handout. I'm talking about a God who, whose hand helps us all the way up. Did you hear what I said? I'm not talking about a handout. I'm not talking about a God that's a genie in a bottle. I'm talking about a God whose hand isn't too short to save, that he can reach down to the, to the chief of sinners and he can grab them up. These hands that I'm talking about, this God who, who wants to reach those who are in our neighborhoods, the God who want to reach them in, this, in Turkey, in these different places, the God whose hand isn't too short to save. There's blessings with this God. And it says this, it says, he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The only way we, we get this blessing is this blessing, these blessings, this righteousness that's found only in Christ. Now, now, they, now the Old Testament, there was some, you had to live up, you know, you had to do all this sacrificial system. You had to do, that's what satisfied God. But, but it was pointed to something greater. We were, it was moving to something that was greater. And it was, his name is Jesus. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 and 10, he says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And here it is. And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith. It always has been about faith. It's always been about faith from the Old Testament saint into the New Testament saint. It's been about faith. He says, the righteousness that is from God that depends on faith. Can I ask you a question, student? Are you dependent on what you do or are you dependent on what he did? Because if you depend on what, what you do, it fails. What, if you depend on what you do, you will fail. But if you look to the God who begins the good work and will bring it to completion, you will never fail. And I want to tell you this morning, we must grab this God who brings us righteousness. God grants us righteousness, salvation. God is a God who gives this. Salvation belongs to the Lord. The psalmist here moves from the individual who is Jesus, and he talks about these individuals. The generation of those who will seek him, who seeks the face of God of Jacob. The only way we can seek his face, the only way we can seek the face of the God of Jacob is, is to be humble in the presence of a holy God. The only way we can enter into his presence, the only way we can enter into his presence is we have to die to self. And we must let Christ, his righteousness, this, this God who, who made him, who knew no sin to, to become sin for us, that, that when God looks at us, he sees the blood of his son. The only way that you and I can enter into his presence, this love has to lift us. You know what I'm talking about? Hey, brother, I can't sing, and I can't even sing in the shower, man. But I, I remember this song, that, that love lifted me. You remember it? I, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deep stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, 
heard my desperate cry. From the waters lifted me. Now I'm safe, am I? Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Has love lifted you today? Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. It says, soul in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. The master of the sea, billows of, of, of billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, to be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love, it lifted me. Has love lifted you today? Has love lifted you from the miry clay? Has he replaced the heart of stone, been replaced it with a heart of flesh? Has love lifted you? There's only one way to enter church, baby. And we're in a church with this blood that cover, covers us. Our God is a loving God. We praise him at all times because we know he began the good work in our lives. Finally, I want you to see, man, not only have we seen that we need to praise God because of his handiwork, we need to praise God because of his holiness and, and because of his hand and because of Jesus' hands that were put on that tree. But we see finally, we see that we need to worship him and praise him at all times because he is the head who is God. Verse 7 says, Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? He's the Lord. He's strong and mighty in battle. He is the Lord. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift up, them, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? It's the Lord, the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And you, verse 7, it says, lift up your, your heads. Lift, lift up your heads. Don't, don't put your heads down, these, these Levitical gatekeepers. Don't, don't have your head down in defeat like God ain't going to come win the victory. Get, lift up your head, oh ancient doors. Oh, lift them up that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? He's the Lord, the covenant keeper. He's not the covenant breaker. Is somebody in here with me need to believe that our God is still here with us? I mean, you you are at war within. You you struggling, man. You you're in chaos, but but you know you need to believe that Yahweh is still with you. Didn't Jesus say? Remember, Doctor Agan always say his last words are his lasting words. Jesus says, "I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you." The king of glory, the king of glory, he's strong, he's mighty in battle, he is mighty in battle. Give, give this visual with me this morning, that our God, the God that was pierced through for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities, that, that this God that, that still will have holes in his hands so you can remember that he is a God that won the battle. Do you hear me this morning that, that, that the, the God that, that when he enters in, like this is a, this is a entering in, like he entered in into the, with the triumphal entry in, in Matthew 21. This is a, a, the same God that, that, that comes and he will come in victory to get his own, to get his. You know why? Because he's him, if I can say it that way. He is him. He is the Messiah. He is the one that was promised long ago. I want to tell you something. We're on a winning team. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory because we got a Savior. We got a God that is coming back to redeem his people. Who is this King of glory? He's, the, he's strong. He's mighty. The Lord, he's mighty in battle. So lift up this refrain, this refrain that goes over. Sing, baby. Sing that the king of glory. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? It is the Lord. The Lord of hosts, the Lord that is the door. Remember, he, the good shepherd of the sheep, he is the gate. He, he is the reason why we can go in. He is this God. He is the God that allows us. He makes a way. And he goes in. The, you know, he, he went in when, in the triumphal entry leading to his actually ascension to go up, be seated at the right hand of the Father, right? 
Hey, and, and, and you know, he, there's also this door that, that he stands and he knocks, right? In Revelation, remember that door? And listen, this door is vitally important. This is why you're in school, because our Savior, man, stands at the door and he knocks and he wants to come in. He is pleading with his people. He wants to come in. The only way that you can get in, the only way that you can enter into his presence is you have to have him. Verse 9 and following, lift up your gates, lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. There's only one. You know, I wanted to, to land a plane this morning by sharing from the doctor, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Jo J Lloyd-Jones, he, 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 he said this, and I think this is a great summary of this, this passage. Lloyd-Jones says, look to him. And the more we look at him, the more hopeless shall we feel by ourselves and in ourselves. And the more shall we become more poor in spirit. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him again and again. And then you will have the things you will, you will have the things to do to yourself. It will be done. You cannot truly look to him without feeling your absolute poverty and emptiness. Then you will say to him, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Empty, hopeless, naked, vile, but he is the all-sufficient one. Yeah, all I need is thee to find, O Lamb of God. I come. Hey, listen, folks. We must clear the stage. We must clear the clutter. We must clear the chaos. We must clear it all. And we must clear the way and lay out this red carpet for this king, this king of glory. Put your eyes on him, students. Don't take your eyes off him. Yeah, man, his ministry is cute, but the Messiah is cuter. So you keep your gaze fixed on him. Jesus, this King of glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are a sovereign God. God, thank you for your handiwork. God, thank you for your holiness. And oh God, we must be a people who are humble and realize that we need access into your, your presence, into your sanctuary. And so God, we sing loud because of our Savior whose name is love, Jesus Christ. We're grateful for his sacrifice. God, we thank you for his hands. We thank you that he's, he hadn't come to give us a handout, but he's come to lift us up out of the miry clay. Oh, God, thank you so much for your sovereignty, for your plan to redeem us, your people. Oh, God, thank you so much for the head, Jesus, of the church, who one day, God, there will be a new Jerusalem, and he will have his own. God, I thank you so much for this seminary. I thank you, God, that we, can, we understand what it means. We understand what it means for the neighbor to need to know Jesus. We understand what it means, God, for the nation to know Jesus and the nations. God, ever let us fix our gaze on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We love you. Help us, God, to keep our eyes fixed on you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.